25 years ago, the St. Vincent and the Grenadines men's senior national team made history by becoming the smallest nation ever to qualify for a major FIFA tournament. In beating Cuba at the 1995 Shell Caribbean Championships and advancing to the 1996 Gold Cup, no other St. Vincent team has come close to that accomplishment in 25 years. Why? What made 1995-96 singular? What people, what forces conspired to make history that is yet to be duplicated? And welcome to our sixth episode of Chair Talk, where we sit down and get to the heart of soul of soccer and life. Today is such an exciting episode for me. Um, for many of you who know, I'm, my family's from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Aranda Ash put together a wonderful podcast talking about the story of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and their journey to the Gold Cup. So I'm going to actually, this is going to be a session that I'm passing over to my Vincentian brethren here to conduct this interview so that we can learn so much more into the inner workings of this amazing podcast that he put together that I want all of you to check out, all of you to learn about the legends in my beautiful island, St. Vincent de Grenadines. So without further ado, I'm going to pass this over to Rhonda Ash. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicole. It's an honor to be um, sharing the Black Soccer Coaches Association platform i um, honored to be on here to, again, like you said, share a story, tell you guys a story. Uh, again, my name is Aranda Ash. I am, was born in the Caribbean island of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the same place where Nicole's parents are from. It's the island somewhere between uh, Grenada, Barbados, St. Lucia. It's a little dot there. And 25 years ago, that island of 110,000 people did an improbable, amazing thing. We qualified for the 1996 Gold Cup, the smallest country at the time to ever do that. Um, I looked at the World FIFA Coca-Cola rankings for December 1995, and the next highest ranked country of, of some population close to ours was 1.2 million people. Again, we are 110,000, and tenth of that population, and we were in that ranks. The problem is nobody knows about that story. Nobody on our island knows about it, and certainly the people in this audience don't know about it. So first and foremost, I'm gonna tell that story. Nicole has given me this platform because she says, she will attest that that's an incredible story, an incredible thing that happened. You know, we spent the last couple of years lauding Iceland for what they did, this small country. Iceland is 500,000 people. We are a fifth of that population. We didn't make the World Cup, but we got for us an incredible distance, made a phenomenal jump. So I wanna talk about that story. The other thing I wanna talk about today is just coaching. Coaching, uh, being a coach, being an admin, and the kinds of roles people who are committed to a process, the kinds of things they can do, and the kinds of places they can take, in this case, a group of 22, 23 year old boys who've never seen anything, and we took them to a height. So we're gonna talk about the Gold Cup, talk about that, and then talk about ways that hopefully Black Coaches Association and other coaches in the listening audience who want to help, we want you to help. It's been 25 years since my country made it to the Gold Cup. And the folks on here who've been back to my country the last 25 years will attest that there's enough talent down there that it really shouldn't take us this long to get back. But we need resources, we need help, we need knowledge. You're gonna hear people who have provided resources sometimes out of their own pockets, who provided knowledge, learned, earned, and who are willing and committed to the process. So we're gonna get started. We're gonna get started by introducing two folks here who were instrumental in that Gold Cup run or instrumental in the history of my island football, Mr. Lenny Taylor. I'm not gonna go over all his accolades. There'll be a link at the bottom of this. You can check him out. And also Mr. Ian Sardine. I think meaning resides in people. So if I tell you who they are right now, it has no meaning for you. But over the next couple of minutes, you're going to understand who they are and you're going to want to click those links to find out more. And you're going to want to come down to find out how you can help them continue to do the amazing job that they did 25 years ago. And in the case of Ian Sardine, what he's still doing at age 120, looking spry, looking spry, what he's continuing to do now. I will start with you, Nicole, again. Why was it important for you to just give us this platform to talk about this? What, what should well, people know? They don't know St. Vincent, they don't know who I am, who Lenny is, who, e, who Ian is, why? Why are we doing this? 
I'll tell you what, I listened to your podcast, Arande, and it brought me back to a time uh, when, as a young girl, I would go to St. Vincent to visit my family. So I remember this time when you're talking about this podcast, I remember many of these faces. So when I'm actually being transported back and you're giving me the details of what happened, and it's such a miraculous story, if you really think about it. Um, for all of us who are from this small and beautiful island, we know just how miraculous that situation is because it's a tiny island. You know, to be able to take out some of the teams that you guys were able to take out, the work that you're able to put in, the development that Lenny Taylor and Ian Sardine and you, Arande, are putting into it, your blood, sweat, and tears that you're pouring into this country. We all want to see this country get to the next level, make another gold cup. And we haven't seen that for 25 years. So I think this story needs to be told. You know, I have a, a pretty good following. So I'm excited to share this platform so that you guys are able to get this story out and to share the work. Because we talk coaches about it as people who are coming back to Vincent as soon as we can to kind of get some work done on the island that I know and love so much. So, and really quickly, guys, just so you know, Arande's not going to talk about himself, but he went to North Carolina State and played soccer, and he was also on that team that we're going to talk about. So I'm going to pass it right back to him. But oh, guys, I'll talk about myself, check out this I, will, I will talk about myself. I know I'm you proud, will. <laughs> I'm a proud Vincentian American man here. I've been here for about 35 years, but my heart and soul is, is with my country. I named the podcast... The title of it is Taylor Made, and it's a play on words for the gentleman you see on the screen right now. His name is Lenny Taylor. Lenny Taylor was born in the island of Jamaica, got drafted by the Cosmos in the 70s, played a little bit there, took over Medgar Evers College in Brooklyn, New York in the 70s and, and late 70s, early 80s, took the program to prominence. And then in the early 90s, Got the bug. The bug to do what, coach? The bug to do what in the early 90s? Try something different. I, um, I was involved in American soccer as of 15 years old. And um, up until that time, I did everything that I possibly could do here. Um, I need a new challenge. The new challenge is going someplace else. I've already earned the A license here. I've already coached college soccer. I've already participated in youth soccer. I was already an instructor for um, um, New York State and also for Florida. I needed a new challenge. And there was a professional league that came on board in the Caribbean called Caribbean Professional Football League. Yeah, then I purchased a franchise for St. Vincent in the league and obviously went there in 92 to, to work on that project. It was quite challenging. Uh, the league folded um, in 1994, 95. It was a natural fit to make the transition into the island life of football, went on to be the national coach and the rest is history. So again, so we, we'll give people a little bit of background, but the, the, again, I implore you to listen to the podcast. Nicole is asking you to, we're asking you to, you won't regret it. It's a fantastic story that gives more color, more details. We're giving you spatterings of what happened. So uh, Coach Lenny Taylor comes to St. Vincent in the early 90s, 90, 1992. It just so happens that at that time, St. Vincent is in the process of qualifying for World Cup 94. So there's a fervor for soccer there. He comes at that time. He is also caught up in that, bringing his knowledge. Um, and the young folks that he's coaching are believing in that, seeing in that, seeing in those possibilities. This is 1992. In 1995, the other gentleman who is on this screen, Mr. Ian Sardine, gets elected to the presidency of our football federation. So now we're looking for a coach. So coach, uh, Ian, why, why Lenny? Why, why was that for you a natural fit? Well, Lenny, Lenny was around in St. Vincent with the High Moon Lions um, professional club. And a lot of those players were the national team players. That is one. So I had connections with him through his friend Arnold because he was staying, he was boarding with Arnold Dalrymple. So 
it was natural for us to go and approach him about helping with the national team. He was already involved. You have to understand as well that finances was a, was a constraint. So you can't go out and hire an international coach with um, zero dollars in your pocket. <laughs> Say that again. How much? What was your operating budget when you started and took over in spring of 1995? What was it? Whatever we could have combined with our salaries <laughs> and afford to pass on. So no million dollar subsidies from FIFA, no check every year for, for six figures, none of that. The FIFA subsidy didn't start until maybe the 2000s, when at the, um, at the turn of the century. So we had to make do with whatever we can afford to donate out of our pockets, okay, so by and large. So again, so from 1992, so sort of a two and a half year gap, Ian, um, Ian Sardine takes over. Again, if you listen to the podcast, a lot happened between those, those years, but we're going to just give you some, some overviews. In the spring of 1995, we make the effort to start qualifying for the Shell Cup, which is the Caribbean Championships. And you mentioned on the podcast that you noticed that in the spring of 1995, they just get it. And again, coaches who are listening to this, we know that feeling. But can you describe what that was like to see that? And I'm going to go to Lenny, I mean, to Ian, to describe what that looked like. So Lenny, what, what do you mean when you said the guys just, they got it, they get it? I am Brazilian bred in the philosophy. And with the Brazilians for so many years, you know, within the Cosmos organizations, the Pele camps, the Cosmos camps, it was one in which tremendous amount of interplay and um, good ball control. But remember from 92, 93, 94, by this time that concept became second nature to the players. They were comfortable playing with each other because they were playing with each other for so long. What do you remember happening? What do you remember the well, well, being as a coach? Sometimes as a coach, we look at it and we go, oh shit, they're getting this. Oh yes. The roles and responsibility of the players become evident. They knew their runs, they knew their offensive shape, they knew their defensive shape, they knew how to group up on the ball to maintain possession, understand how to change the point of attack. They were doing it because they hear it and it worked for them and they were enjoying it. And um, a wonderful thing developed, and it just mushroomed. Ian, what did you see? Because you've been involved with the Federation and in football, I mean, for over 50 years now. So you're in different capacities all over the island. What was different about 95, that spring, and you started to see, all right, maybe there's a possibility that we can do something and go someplace that maybe St. Vincent hasn't been? Um, you have to go back a little to 92, when we qualified for the, in the World Cup to play against countries like Mexico and the Central American countries, um, Honduras and, and others. By that time, it, grew, it um, lifted the, the players' perception of football. So they became a lot more involved and they saw more possibility of them going out and getting something out of football, professional contracts. That was the, the aim. So by 95, all that euphoria out of, from following 92, all that euphoria was still around. And the young ones got the bug. So they were interested in playing. They were willing to do the hard work that is required to go to the next level. So by 95, when um, by, by good fortune, I was elected president. The kids and them, the kids were already willing and eager to go forward. July of 1995, the team is going to the Cayman Islands to represent St. Vincent in the Caribbean Championships. Young team, hadn't really proven themselves. There were a lot of older veterans who kind of aged out. What was the reaction from this footballing public in St. Vincent to you prior to that Cayman Islands trip? 
there wasn't much faith that we would be successful in the Cayman Islands. And um, we wouldn't be a credit to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I remember getting a call from the radio station in Barbados. And they asked me, do you think you have a chance to win the tournament or do well in the tournament? And my answer was, we have a good chance as any. And the guy stood there for about 10, 15 seconds. How could this guy say that? I can remember the radio shows. Nobody believed. But I knew that I have a nucleus from Hyrule. We had the key midfielders. We had the spine. We had the speed on the outside. I knew there was the talent. And I said from the beginning, we will qualify and we will do well. And it was like a joke. So they laughed us to scorn. But I knew that we were changing the guard and we would have a generation of players that would be able to serve St. Vincent and the Grenadines for the next decade. I thought we should build it on younger kids and you listen to podcasts, you'll see that was the right decision. Now, Ian, during that Cayman's run, you actually stayed in St. Vincent. So you did not accompany the team to the Cayman Islands for the week, the week and a half, they ended up being there, involved in this really monumental event. Why did you make that decision? Um, my involvement in soccer and football was never about me. I used football as an incentive for the kids. I'm a teacher, and I've, I was a teacher for years. I taught the, the transition period between the primary and the secondary, going into high school. And the only incentive that you had for the boys in particular was soccer, because you had very little sport they could participate in in the country. And in my class in school, I would use the sport as an incentive, as a, a reason for them to stay in school, do the academics, because they get the rewards of playing football and so on. It continued. So when I got into the presidency of football, it didn't change. Going to the Cayman was um, the, the biggest thing for me, the performance and the, the team was. And then my going may have limited the number of players we could have sent because finance was a constraint. Finance was a definite constraint to the point where, and I wish he was here, but if you listen to the podcast, anybody will recognize the voice and the timber and the commitment level of a Mr. Arnold Dalrymple. Mm. So either of you can speak on that, specifically the story of him mortgaging his house. And then he says it couldn't have been more than two or three days before the team was scheduled to leave. Mortgaging his house so that players could have flights to get to the Cayman Islands to ultimately take part in, part in the tournament that puts us someplace to tell this incredible story. Here's team treasurer, manager, and banker, Arnold Dalrymple. At what point did you realize there was not enough money to buy tickets? We knew that all the time, that there was no money, but we expected the lotto to make up the balance of the money. So we went ahead, we booked our tickets. When we went to the lotto, they said to us that the Prime Minister was out and we couldn't get the money. He's the one who would have to make the decision. And he wouldn't be back till about, I think it was four and a half weeks or something. And the team's supposed to be leaving in a week. I kept everything calm and cool while they were running up and down. I said to Ian, I'm going to take a risk. I know, I know this team is going to do good. When were you aware, all right, we got tickets, we are going? The longest it could be two days before. So we went into the car bank, I spoke to the guys. I said to him, when I go mortgage my house. What? Excuse me? A St. Vincent football executive is doing what? I can give you my house, and I expected well. We would have done well, and by the time we came back, at least Lotto would have given us some money. And by grace of God, it happened. Unbelievable, Raul. Um, I'm Dalrymple, a good man, very humble, hard worker, believed in the project, and um, let's emphasize, we did not know how we were going to get to the Caribbean Championship. 
And um, he did this magnificent thing, he put his house up to fund the flights to Cayman Island. Wow. So you know the man believed in his heart and he loved the project and he knew how important it was for his country. My main aim is to sit back and watch him with the football do well and know deep down in my heart that I had a part in it. Not I had, I knew that team would have done well. How many people do you think really know what you did? On this sporty moment, this is what needed to be done for football. Now, you see, that's the thing. When I'm into something, you know, and you're into it, you know, what it takes to make it happen, I'll do it. I'll, I'll forever you know, respect that, you know, decision that he made. Can you imagine putting your house up? You're not going to probably lose your house, but you're going to have thousands of dollars that you owe on it. And to get some young kids to the championship, he made that decision. He must be commended for that. He has to be commended for that. And again, later that Later that year, while the team is getting ready a few weeks away from preparation for the Gold Cup, we're not going to go into it. Listen to the podcast to hear more, but he slaughters his own cow to feed the kids. It yeah. is that level of commitment. Yeah. Yeah. We talk about Ian Sardine. Ian Sardine lives in the capital of St. Vincent. And where we were, and we'll get to this later on, where we were to prepare for the Gold Cup was basically the last inhabited piece of, piece of earth in a corner of the island. And this man was driving back and forth on very dangerous, unlit, winding roads. But listen to the podcast. You have to explain. You have no, to explain no, no. We're, that, gonna have to, we're gonna tease it. This is called a teaser, Nicole. They gotta listen to the podcast to hear the rest. We're gonna move on. It's, they gotta listen to it. Listen to but, it. But, but I, I want to get to the Caymans. Orandi. Yes. yes, sir. Um, I told you that the executive was totally committed to the project. Um, there are other members that did similar to Arnold and committed themselves fully because Michael John would have done that, a similar thing um, with his vehicle when we go into the um, World Cup because the funds from Congo Caps did not come through on time for us to meet our obligations. Um, but throughout the, the 95 run, these are some of the things that had to be done and all the members would have committed um, their resources to the project. When we go on camp, we had to go in our pockets. When we travel, we had to go in our pockets. So no pay, no FIFA funding. Y'all are committed to this from your pocket. And eventually we talk to, we'll talk about how Lenny Taylor, after doing this since 1992, and specifically from spring of 1995 on that miracle run to when we played the Gold Cup in 1996, you would assume a Bora Militinovich, a... Uh, uh, name name any coach would get some sort of bonus, but coach, how much did you get paid? Bonus. Energy. <laughs> bonus. Yeah, yeah. Nah. How, how much did you get paid? What was your bonus? What was your bonus for that year of work? There was a bonus um, for that period. Um, there was no there was no salary. Um, at the end of the Gold Cup, there was a thousand dollars stipend. So. For that job, which I think it's um, a wonderful job, it was the commitment of helping the people, helping the kids, most of them who played for, played at Hyrule Lions. That commitment was more important than anything else as to helping a group of people, of, of players succeed. Simple. But right about now, I want to take you to the Cayman Islands, July 1995, the Shell Cup semifinals. An unknown ragamuffin team, average age 23 years old, laughed at for looking like schoolboys, but in a place of honor nonetheless, with Pele looking on in the stands, down 1-0 at halftime, with so much to play for. So again, you're home, Ian. You're home. We're down 1-0 at halftime. you on your veranda, on your porch, listening to the radio with your bottle of scotch. With your bottle, of <laughs> what what are you thinking? What are you thinking as president? What are you thinking? Like par for the course? Um, if you know the pressures you go through with these islands, you would understand the the um, 
nervous um, pressures you had. So by by the halftime of that game, I had gone to the porch just patrolling up and down. Um, sometimes I turn off the radio just to get a relief because you needed a, a little break from the nervous tension. So we, we come out of halftime down 1-0. And Nicole, I'll pivot to you because you cited this speech or this moment as the one that kind of like, oh my God, this story is incredible. Uh, it speaks to the spirit of the island, you know, and the spirit of the West Indies. And I think when you have leadership that's willing to make the sacrifices because they believe in a group of schoolboys who, you know, were, didn't have the equipment, they didn't have the food, they didn't have the money, but you had a group of supportive and nurturing and that believed in you so much that they were going to sacrifice things in their life, their home, their animals. That says a lot to a group of young men who are on a field and they're not supposed to be there. But the people who are there with you believe in you so much that they're willing to sacrifice their livelihood for you. It's the example that you guys set, I think, too, that played a role in that game. I, I would run through a wall for people who, who make sacrifices to me like that. But Lenny, let's talk about that speech because um, Arande calls you the magic, and I think you gave them some magic in that moment there. <laughs> Here's Coach Lenny talking. I went into the game very confident. And of course, if you are confident, your pre-game, your match preparations are very confident and positive and reassuring to the player. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. And Cuba was running plays. Overlapping wing backs coming down. Slipping across the circle. We're in a heap of trouble now because they're consistently doing that. We did not find a way to be able to prevent the cross from the flanks. It was a tense situation. There was a little bit of hostility. We we're down. Anyhow, at halftime, I walked briskly across the field into the locker room. I wanted to be there to greet them when they came in with positivity. I let everyone sat down. They got whatever, their water, whatever. I didn't say anything. We have this thing, let the players come in, let them cuss at each other for 30 seconds, and then you call order. We call order. My halftime speech was not about soccer. It wasn't about X's and O's. It was going to them and saying, here's your opportunity. You can change your life today. You can go back to St. Vincent. You don't have to beg someone $5 or for a pair of shoes, you can write the ticket for the rest of your life. You've got 45 minutes to change everything about your career. I walked out and left them for a little bit. This is your time. You need to achieve this victory because the rewards are great coming to the Gold Cup. Most of these kids would be seen. Don't know what went on that time, but this is my applied psychology to get to them because I don't think you can find words at this time, but to show them their situation and how they can move out of the situation that they are on the island. I came back in. We held hands, we walked out early, we stood there to get some fresh breeze. And I told them, this can change your life. Oh, they were like flying when they went back on the field. At the same time for me, from a coaching point of view, is I promised these kids that we would get there. So then there, there was a little bit of pressure because if we don't go out and win this game or even tie this game, we have no chance of getting to the finals and first and second go to the gold cup. It's not like today where four or five teams from the Caribbean go to the gold cup. You either has to win or it's runner up. So of course the emphasis and the energy was different. You see, and I believe everything can be accomplished with the right energy. And that, I just said that plainly, this is your chance to move to the next level.
didn't talk X's and O's. I just reached down in their spirit. They responded. And the podcast will emphasize how well they expanded. Yeah, we'll let we'll let, we'll let, we'll let, we'll the, let the podcast speak for itself and and see what happened in the second half of that game. But I'll throw it to Ian. Ian, so you're in St. Vincent, uh, a couple a couple hundred miles away. Again, listening on the radio. There's no TV here. We're listening on the radio. Whistle whistle blows. The words that I use, I think, in the podcast are maybe release, and you won't say it, but I'll say it. Vindication. Why? Why was it so much release to get that result? And a little bit of vindication. Think of the, all the hard work that the boy had to um, get to um, overcome, all the difficulties to get to this point. And then they were successful. I think throughout the, the island in, in villages and so, because we listened to the radio with all our sport, cricket, football, and they would know the results. They would have been celebrated in all the villages because the kids come from these uh, small villages. And uh, at the end of that game, when that whistle blew, you know that they were celebrating. And, but for me, it was more a sense of relief that we had done what we had set out to do and that the boys had found what they wanted. I know you won't say it now, but throughout that tenure from early 1995 until that result came in, in July of, of that year, I mean, there are, there are forces behind you every single day coming after you, trying to destroy or get you ousted. So, I mean, again, you won't go into it too much, and the podcast kind of goes into that, and this is the kind of part that made Nicole mad to see that her island, where her parents are from, wonderful paradise place, beautiful people, but sometimes, you know, it's heavy is the head that wears the crown. You know, heavy is the head that wears the crown, especially when you do the impossible. Are you starting to to, to uh, gain the success? Nobody wants to see you shine. They didn't think you should. They didn't think Coach Lenny could take the team all the way to the Cayman Islands and get the result. They didn't think Ian could lead a federation. He does. And now they're even doubling their efforts to try to get rid of them, undermine them. And again, what did you hear in that part of the story, Nicole, listening that kind of gave you pause. It's just never been my experience in, in my country, right? I always set this high standard for the island of St. Vincent and the Grenadines because I have amazing family and friends there. But I will say this, that part of the podcast, it, it, it took a quick turn because there's that part of the joy. And then to hear, you know, after you hear the drastic things that these guys were doing for this team and then to hear how they were treated, it hurt your heart. You know, because you, especially knowing them now, I didn't know them back there then. But the fact that Lenny Taylor still has a smile on his face all the time, it's the fact that Ian Sardine is still doing the work that he's doing, it just restores my faith in island people that we do things for the right reasons. Um, that there's pure quality and class and the leadership of this this group that took this team to to, to lengths that they didn't think they could go to. So my faith is restored. I'm, I'm going to try to put a positive spin on, you know, <laughs> you know how hurt, hurt I was for these two guys because I know them. And it's I would have never known that had happened to them um, from the dispositions that they have now. You know, the, the joyful, sp- smiling natures and the fight that Ian still has to develop soccer in this country. Um, I'm proud of them and I just love the work that they did. But it, it, made, me, it made me angry because I know who they are and I know their hearts. Again, the whole Gold Cup story for me it's not the results when we got to California because we were up against the Mexican national team who was in the World Cup two years before. We were up against Central American power, Guatemala. So I'm not going to go too much into that part. I'm going to leave that. It's called a teaser. I'm going to tease it. Go check out the podcast. It's called <laughs> Taylor Made, The Improbable Journey of the 1995-96 St. Vincent the Men's, St. Vincent and the Grenadines Men's National Team and an Improbable Run to the Gold Cup. So go listen to the rest of it and you'll understand some other things that happened. But I'll tease something. I'll tease something. So we get back from the Cayman Islands. Coach Taylor gives the team about a month off. They have to get ready for the Winwood Island Championship. We play the Winwood Island Championships in November, December of that year. We don't do too well. The decision is made to sequester the team in, again, the, the last inhabited piece of earth on the island. It was an unpopular decision. 
by from the, the perspective of a lot of soccer people on the island because they couldn't see the players, couldn't interact with the players. But why was it important to you, Coach Lenny, to take the players there to a place called well, course, uh, It's very quiet. And one of the things, Arandi, is when the boys go back to their natural habitat in their own towns, I wanted to keep away that negativism from their brain. Um, people saying this or saying that. I think they needed a clear head to prepare to go to the Gold Cup. And um, to, to be in isolation to prepare, I think that was the best thing for them. And my soccer experience tells me and the people who I learn football tells me that here is a type of environment in which you can have total concentration with your players and prepare them for this huge, huge occasion. I think that is set well because everyone wanted to be able to talk to or contact the players. I mean, coming back from the Cayman qualified to go to the World Cup, they have a new status. Yeah, they're successful. So socially, I took them away and was working with them. And I think maybe the distractors weren't able to distract as much. The people that were bent on distracting inside the Federation, I want to point that out. These are not random people in the streets. There are people being led by other folks under Ian, supposedly helping our team, helping Coach Lenny, who yeah. were, and I'll just get to it because this is a major part of the podcast. They accuse you of basically being a weed runner, a marijuana runner, that we went to Richmond, that part of the country, and it is, Richmond has a history and is synonymous with uh, the cultivation of, of ganja marijuana. But why in the world would we be thinking about that as players? Why in the world would an administration be thinking about that? Ian, what were our worries in December of 1995? What was the number one worry for the Federation and you? Well, finance was always the, the number one worry with, uh, because football is a team sport. You're talking about 20 or 30 kids you have to put in camp, plus five or six um, um, coaches and, and team teams managers. But by December of 1995, we had gone to a few camps. And so we had experience of what it is like to camp in some of these, and in some of the other locations. There were too many people showing up at camp at all hours. They would distract the boys. And of course, they're young men. If the girls show up outside, they would go and um, you can't stop that. Um, you could try, right, but it's right. difficult to cut it out. So by '95, we had realized, and Lenny had requested that we have an isolated location. So we went to Richmond. There are great um, facilities for training. La Soufra is just above you. All right, four thousand feet high. Then there is waterfalls you could jog to, about two miles up. You had long stretches of beaches, so your, your physical work could be done there. So you had a lot of um, positives that you can get from that location. Right. And then you have the, the, the isolation, isolation, where you had total, total control over what over the kids and right. not enough, not, and no distraction from the, the local population. Of course, the, the distractors in, in the capital would have been another key, another thing. They had a field day with saying all they want to say. But the, the, the team itself was isolated from that. And what they kept saying loud and clear on the radio, in the newspaper while we were getting ready. And at this point, I am now in St. Vincent. I had left the island in August of 1985. And with the help of Ian Sardine, who recommended me, remembered me because I was an amazing player at seven, eight years old, <laughs> hanging with 11, 12 year olds. But he remembered me, reached out to my coach at North Carolina State University. Coach uh, Lenny invited me and I was at that camp in Richmond, December 15th, 1995. And I'll be blunt. My biggest concern was food. Let's just get to food. It was food. 
It was food. So, Coach Landy, on the podcast, you mentioned that X's and O's, the football, um, the second was was the second or third biggest concern in that preparation phase, the part where it should be the most important. So, one, you're dealing with people who are saying in the newspaper, on the radio, that you're a weed guy, that you shouldn't be doing this. They're trying to destroy you while we're getting ready to do the most important thing we've ever done in our island's football history. And then every day you have to deal with what? Let's count them out. Food. Food. Food and food. (laughs) So sometimes in the downtime after training, I go out and scour food. And you have to balance it and make it last. To the point where it's not balancing enough, I have to jump in that little jeep that I have with Everett Young. And there was another young man, I can't remember his name, connecting me with the farmers in the area. One of the farmers even gave us a whole goat. We took the goat back to get bunches of bananas, edos, yams, whatever the farmers had, they would throw it in the jeep and I'll drive it back. When Lenny said they were bought in a pool, I killed a cow. I came down there with it, pretty teeth. Your own family cow, or you, you bought one, or how? how my, you my cow. You know, people don't understand what is commitment, you know. Well, you know, at the end of each training session, I have to worry about how the players are going to eat. Whether I'm going to have sardine, brings a bo- box of chicken down, or I have to go to Kingstown, or I have to go to the various farms in the area. I remember I was given a goat, some chickens, for the players to eat. There was absolutely no time to do anything other than making sure we can get through today. Forget about tomorrow. Let's get through today with three meals, some training and um, move on. Camp in Richmond Vale was time for Coach Lenny to get serious again. Get the players back to that Cayman Island vibe, that energy, that belief to motivate, to inspire, to drive, to push, to push, to push. Unfortunately, he had to do it with less while being stressed more. All the football talking heads were complaining that the players were isolated at Richmond Vale. And we were. There was nobody around. Nobody to go to. Nobody to talk to. Nobody to get distracted by. All we had was each other. So, Ian, I don't think on the podcast I asked you, but I'm going to ask you now. Knowing what you saw being written in the newspaper, knowing what you... I know you didn't... You turned off the radio because there was just too much negativity at one point. But, I mean, you can't... You can't not have it seep into you. You still have to go into a federation office and literally deal with somebody sitting next to you who wants to destroy you and the coach that you've established. The coach that's building something there. You know, how did you, I never asked you, but how did you shore up Lenny? What, what kinds of conversations were you guys having daily? Did you have to kind of drive down to Richmond and Kingstown and just put your arms around him and say, there's a couple more weeks we're going to do this. I mean, I never asked you that. Like, like um, us, Lenny was fully committed to the, to the process. So he wasn't taking on the, the, the negatives, even if he heard the comments. All I did was plug holes, fight off the detractors, plug holes, try to keep it together. And the biggest hole was that we needed to get ready to play the Gold Cup. Mexico was waiting. Football took a minimum amount of my time preparing, doing sessions. I mean, it became overwhelming. Was there a moment that you remember losing it in private? I'm sure. I knew after the Gold Cup that was it. That decision was made even before we leave St. Vincent. I knew that there's no way I could continue doing this. And I'm going to leave it to the audience members to go and listen to the podcast again. The link it will be somewhere down here um, to figure out and hear what happened once we got to California to take part in the Gold Cup and make FIFA history, world history, island history, and footballing history in general. I, I want to talk now, kind of piggyback of what uh, you just said, Ian. And in the podcast, I call it the Holy Trinity, more or less. You, Dalrymple, 
and Coach Lenny Taylor. Um, six legs, one mind. Have each other's back. Work together. The philosophy is we're going to have youth. We're going to develop them. We started this four years ago or three years ago in 1992. We're going to stick with it. The process is being successful. We did a great job in the Caymans in July of 1995. We have done something unprecedented, something that no other small island has ever done in the history Enough. of football. Never. December 1995, St. Vincent the Grenadines is ranked 95th in the world with 110,000 people. No money. Manslaughter and cows to feed the players. And That's I was correct. there in December, no food. I kid you not. Well, and I, I remember a day in particular, and, and perhaps it's an evening coach where you're out scouring for food, or at that point you might've been frustrated thinking, what the hell am I doing in this place? But we had no food. And one of our players, and we, we talk about it in the podcast, Fitz Bramble, who was the keeper. I remember him and a couple of senior guys Dexter Walker, Ned, somebody else. They might have gathered money from everybody. Fitz had a car in camp. He got in his Toyota Celica, drove to Shadow Bel Air, which was the next town over. We got some pasta, some what is that? What is that? Biscuit Cricks? Cricks or something like that? The Cricks biscuits. And we had that for dinner. But it speaks to the fact that when there is not a structure, if you would provided for you, and Nicole, you've mentioned this, it's, it's incumbent upon, upon people, in this case, players, and then a step above that, Coach Lenny, not getting paid, no money, this man is doing this for no money, just do the work. For the players, what do we need to eat? We just got to go do it, and we got to get we got to get some food in us so we can perform. And above Coach Lenny, Al Rimple and Ian Taylor, can't hear the detractors, <laughs> can't listen to them. I am tired. I'm working nine to five. Dalrymple's working nine to, well, nine to three, Ian. Dalrymple's working nine to five. And again, people would understand this, but I hope you get a sense in the podcast, having to drive two hours or not, maybe an hour and a half, whatever it is, in the dead of night to go take care of these problems that keep coming up over and over again. And still, still we keep going. This is why this story is incredible. And I think Again, I'm speaking mm-hmm. to black coaches, but I'm also talking to coaches in general because I know your audience is bigger than just black Everybody. Coaches. Nicole. Yeah. But it speaks to our struggle. In order to get just half the distance, we got to do twice the work. And in this mm-hmm. case, with this story, with this island at that time, it is 10 times the work that people committed to getting it done and they got it done. So why should you listen to this podcast? That's why. That's why. And it hasn't been replicated in our country in 25 years. Why? Because these men here, them, they're not a part of it. And and the reason I wanted to put this podcast and tell this story, you don't need the men, you need the ideas. Their ideas are everlasting. Their willingness to commit and put in the work is everlasting. Listen, find an example, then replicate it, replicate it. I want to then transition and then we're going to start wrapping this up because people got dinner to make, people got things to do. They got to go, they got to go coach. They got to go recruit. They got to do all this stuff. But Nicole, I'm going to, I'm going to start with you here because I started with you in the beginning. Ian talked about the commitment level and togetherness and putting his arms around Lenny, comforting him, making sure that this idea can keep going. As the president of this organization, I'm sure you've, you've been in situations where you know, something comes up and you're like, God, why am I here? Why am I doing this? So why, 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 why are you doing this? Why are you involved in the BSC? And by extension, why do you want them involved in some way in St. Vincent? Or why are you involved in St. Vincent? So for me, it's always about the advancement of Black in the sport of soccer. And I mean, you touched on it in such a way that really will make people of all races understand the struggle of what it is to be a black coach um, or even an administrator or, you know, a leader like myself. Um, There are struggles, there are challenges, there are adversities, but you can't allow that to ever get to the forefront of your mind because there's a purpose. There's a mission in the work. And the most important thing is there's a next generation that you want to make sure that your work is impacting. You want to make sure that the stories of Ian and Lenny are told so that some of these things don't happen again. So that's why I love this story, especially is because it talks about a brotherhood amongst 
administrators from Ian, uh, Lenny, and many of the people who were working with them who had the same type of heart, and then the players on that team to come together and to do the work, <sighs> how resilient we are. It's such an, that's what I think got me the most is how I don't care what challenges are coming our way, we can overcome. That's the power of the story. And that's why I love it so much. And that's why I think our coaches are going to love this story is because it's, it's something we all experience. We have these challenges, but we overcome time and time again. And we will make a future that's better for the next generation. Okay. And I'm going to make a plea to them, to the coaches in the BSC uh, when we wrap this thing up. But Coach Lenny, um, again, prior to coming to St. Vincent in 92, you were a coach at Medgar Evers College in Brooklyn. You uh, established a state championship team and club in, in Florida. But you mentioned earlier, more or less about a glass ceiling in terms of um, moving up the soccer ranks in this country at that time. On the podcast, you talk about you were, you were licensing coaches. And so you would go to these communities in Central Florida with lawyers, doctors, and want to be coaches and just pick up on that. What, what did you experience? Talk about being at the back of the class and watching these people come in. And, and then what did you experience? Well, I came to Florida in 1980 um, with like three years of um, coaching, education, instruction in New York State. So when I came here in 1980, in South Florida, I was practically the only person that was certified to train coaches. So I would go all over the state of Florida to do courses. And I'd get into a course, there'd be 35, 40 people in the course. I got in, I sat in the back, wait for administration to take place all the paperwork. Then it's time for the course to begin and they introduced the instructor. People thought I was just, you know, somebody taking the course. And um, after I'm introduced and I go up and I stand before the class, I put my name on the board, I put my license number and um, you could feel the snickers of people. Well, you, you, your constituents are lawyers and doctors because those are the coaches of youth soccer in America, especially at that time. Influential people. How could we have this guy as the instructor? Something must be wrong. So in 10 or 15 minutes, you have to sell everybody on your knowledge. And it's interesting that in half an hour, you have everybody eating out of your hand because what you're delivering, you know, is magic to their ears. We should not be getting this from a black guy. Let's not be political correct here. You can't. And after, you know, you told him, well, I was an All-American. I was drafted to the Cosmos. I did this and this and we started teaching. Everyone wants to be your friend because knowledge is power. So that's the unique opportunity that I had to be dealing with that in America. So to go to St. Vincent and the Grenadines, that's nothing. I was already conditioned to deal with that because of what I had to, to deal with in America. And this is not one class. I said I trained 10,000 D, E, and F licenses in America. Coaches. It's everywhere you go. You have to prove yourself. Now, I always tell the story that in America, the guy that you train to be a coach will be your boss and there's nothing you can do about it. Still to this day. So that's where the glass ceiling was. My head, my knowledge... I need some other challenge. So getting to St. Vincent, I was more than prepared to deal with whatever comes at me. I continually worked until the last day, the same way as I did the first. So I want to thank Ian Sardine and his group to give me the opportunity so that I could get some international experience. That's how humbly you know, I am coming to the situation. 
without that experience, I would just be another American coach. So that's a road I had to travel on, and I am thankful. Well, Ian, you're still on that road. You've been doing this for longer than I've been alive. And I'm not, I'm, I, I'll admit that there's some, there's some color in there. There's gray, there's some color in there. So I'm a little older than I look. I'm a little older than I look there. But we talked about the fact that you coached me or was in the program where I attended when I was six years old, 1982, 83 in Kingstown. So you've been in this game for a long time, football, but also just around young people. Um, talk to the people a little bit about what you're doing in St. Vincent right now with System 3. Talk a little bit about sort of the, the, uh, the avenues you've opened up for college, for, for getting kids to college the last few years, because again, the audience right now is college coaches, and we're gonna get to why it is important that they kind of hear this, and if they have seven to 10 days in two years, we'll put you up in St. Vincent, we want you to come down there so we don't have to wait another 25 years to get a boys team to the Gold Cup, and perhaps a women's team to a U20 or U21, doing well in the CONCACAF Championship. So, Ian, um, why have you stayed doing this steady for 50 years, man? With nothing, with nothing, no reason, nothing. I enjoy what I'm doing. That's the first thing. But let me first of all say that I hope I'm in some position to allow Letty to get back, get paid for some of the work that he did here all those years ago, because we owe him that. We still owe him, and I hope that at some point he gets some rewards for his um, sacrifices. Secondly, maybe by accident, more than design, we may have hit on a formula for the success that we had in 95, simply because the boys had shared difficulties. They had to undergo among themselves. They had to make a sacrifice themselves to be part of the process. So they invested in it as well. You talked about Fitz going and, and, and securing supplies. That, those things help to pull the team together and make them stronger as individuals and as teams. That is why so much of those guys are now coaches and leaders in the various um, parts in life. But for myself, I have been doing what I'm doing for more than 40, 50 years, um, simply because I enjoy it. And it brings reward for the kids that are involved in the process. I have an academy here. I, I take in children from five and, uh, and up, and we go right up to adults. I have teams in every age group. We participate in all the tournaments, not only locally, but regionally. We, we go out when we can, when the finances allow. Um, mainly to the neighboring islands because the, air, the cost of air transport is too high to go further afield. Um, the academy assists when it can with students going to college. At the moment, there are about 18 or 20 that are in college in states and um, university. Some are graduating this year. That has gone with the assistance of the academy. And those, those are, are things that I feel that are my rewards because I know that I've made a difference to some kids. Quite a few of them would give back to the people, to the kids, their kids and other kids after. So I think that with the assistance that can be gotten from others, we can help even more the Vincentian you because they need help. And here's what I promised. I know I spoke with the Federation and with Ian and some different people. And this is my promise that I'm going to make sure that we have coaches um, that you know we bring down to. What I would like to do is to do a yearly coaching education in St. Vincent. I would also like to make sure that we're doing a college showcase so that any talent that you have within your program have the opportunity to be seen by college coaches um, or to even just learn the college process for what it is to come over to the state. And also, I want to do yearly clinics 
where we're bringing some of our top coaches and celebrity players over, similar to what we do with um, some of my national programs. So that is what I'm going to, you know, work on with you guys, because I know, Aronde, you have a camp that you do. Um, Ian has his, his System 3. You know, Lenny's so involved around the Caribbean. But what I'm going to do as chair of the Black Career Coaches Association is make sure that I am investing my time and my resources into the island. Um, and we'll work together to see that this next generation can make it to that Gold Cup. And I'm going to take it even further. I want to see St. Vincent. I want to be able to cheer for U.S. and St. Vincent in a World Cup. I'm going to push it that far. <laughs> uh, that's day. a far, far, One far day. push. Lenny and I have some theories about how far we can go, but that's a far, far, far push. So I'm going to add my two cents at this point, and then we'll let Coach Lenny um, kind of wrap it up. And then Nicole can put a bow on all this because this is your show. And I thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to take it over today and to share this story again. The podcast is Taylor Made, the story of the 1995-96 in the Vincent and the Grenadines men's national team, and it's an improbable run to the Gold Cup. It's on all streaming platforms. Go listen to it if you haven't already. Take the time. It's a wonderful story. You'll respect and love these two men even more once you hear it. Is that not right, Nicole? That is a fact. And I just have to add to that, um, Orande, this podcast is so well done that it reminded me of Cool Runnings. Um, so I believe that this is something that will turn into a movie. I believe that this is something that can be a 30 for 30 documentation with ESPN, or it could be a Netflix. Doc. It could, it's, some, it's of such quality. Um, again, it, it, I listened to all five episodes in one night. And I was exhausted. I told you, I could, I told you, I was like, I'm tired, but it was so good that I listened to every one of the episodes. Tired, not that. because they were bad. You were I tired. Was exhausted. It no, was I was so tired good before. and you were up thinking yeah. about it. <laughs> no, I was exhausted before that. And I'm like, I can't listen to this. And then I ended up listening to the first one, and then the second, and then the third, then the fourth, and the fifth. It was really good. So I, um, I think it's going to be a movie one day. That's how well I think you guys did with soon, that. So soon, soon, that. soon, soon, soon. <laughs> Anybody from ESPN? Let us know anybody who who likes to create good um, quality video and movies. This is a story. It's a wonderful story, but go ahead and, and find out for yourself. Uh, Nicole mentioned that I um, also do a similar program like Ian's um, on a smaller scale. Ian's got a, a big academy called System 3. It's one of the premier youth academies in the country. About how many kids, Ian? About 300. 300. So I am from a town... Um, about 45 minutes, or so, actually 35, 40 minutes from Ian called Barrily. And there, Barrily is known as to produce, for whatever reason, we produce a lot of really good soccer players. And so my thought about 10 years ago was these players are being produced without any training. What if we just introduce training? And not even great training, because that's one of the issues that um, we have in St. Vincent. We don't have a lot of quality coaches who are as committed as these two gentlemen, 40, 50 years in the game, sacrifice whatever it takes to make sure the kids get better. So the number one excuse I kept hearing 10, 12 years ago, well, we don't have equipment. We don't have balls. So I've been coaching club soccer for 20 years. And I know a kid will go through, especially between the ages of 12 and 14, at least two pairs of cleats every season between August and May because they're growing. And these cleats are just sitting in the garage. They have old soccer balls in the garage. They have old uniforms in the garage. So I simply asked parents one day, just give them to me. And a lot of the parents were happy because they're like, oh my God, I don't know what I'm going to do with all this stuff is just taking up space. So I get all the equipment. I put them in a barrel. I ship them to St. Vincent. I go down. I take people that I know, that I know have the same heart and mindset that I do, same way Ian and, um, and Lenny are committed. And we go down there for a week, 10 days, put on a free camp for the kids in my hometown. My dream, my wish for black coaches, for any coach in this country who sees potential in this island the way Lenny did, the way Ian did, is to come down. Come down. My spiel and my sell to any of my coaching colleagues, any of my friends is, look, it's two hours, Monday through Friday, 8 o'clock to 10, 10.30. You have the rest of the day to enjoy paradise. And St. Vincent is paradise. Mm -hmm. St. Vincent is unspoiled paradise. What is St. Vincent? You have no idea, but you've seen it already. It's the first 15 minutes of Pirates of the Caribbean. It is literally my hometown of Barley. 
the reason we have a soccer field in my in my um, in my community that is about 400 yards from where they filmed the Pirates of the Caribbean is because they needed some place to put all the trailers. So the field where they put all the trailers, I think folks in my town said, look, when y'all leave, can you grade it? Can you make it smooth? They said, yes, they made it smooth. So we now have a soccer field in my community where I go to every summer. You get about a hundred kids out there and they play soccer. <laughs> Beyond that, every Saturday morning, there's a gentleman, my saint, the person who makes this thing happen, uh, a person, again, that tree of knowledge that you talk about where somebody's been influenced by somebody else and they pass on that goodness, the way Lenny has done that with me, the way Ian has done that with me. Well, Ian did that to a kid in my hometown, a kid that played for him. His name is Jason Frederick. I met Jason when he was 17 years old and I said, Jason, can you help me out? Can you just come out every Saturday morning and make sure these kids are playing? And he did it. Why? Because he saw Ian do it. No money. I haven't paid Jason one cent in 10 years. And he still does it. Those are the kinds of people that we need. Those are the kinds of people that are, they exist on the island. A lot of times they're afraid to step out and do the thing. Unfortunately, sometimes, and maybe Lenny can address that, we need somebody from the outside who knows more to come in and show us. So I did that with my community. Lenny did that between 1992 and 1996. And our football was better for it then. And if people pay attention to the story, it will be better for it now and better for our football in the future. So I am imploring, I'm looking right at this camera and I'm imploring anybody in the listening audience who really wants to make a difference in terms of coaching. I haven't coached for four months because of COVID-19. I had a little camp for kids in my community this week, Coach, Coach Lenny, and I was out there Thursday yelling and screaming in an excited, not in an excited fashion because I forgot what that felt like. I had 18 kids and I'm putting them through some passing patterns and they did it on Thursday, last day, Friday, they, they're kind of getting it. Oh my God, I felt so good. I forgot what that felt like. You coaches out there, if you want to be reminded through all this, you know, college football administrative paperwork that can frustrate you, you know why I know that? Because I was an assistant soccer coach at North Carolina State for five years. I know the work you have to do. And I know sometimes it can be frustrating. And if you want to be reminded as to why you got into this game, why you loved playing, why you love coaching, there is an island between St. Lucia, Grenada, and Barbados that is waiting for you. It's a beautiful piece of earth. It's called St. Vincent. It is the land of the blessed. And there are kids who will be blessed by your presence if you show up for seven to 10 days, once a year, or every two years. Ian will be incredibly grateful. Nicole will be incredibly grateful. Lenny, his legacy will be made stronger and it will continue because of your presence. How do you come down there? Get in touch with Nicole. Get in touch with me. I'm on social media. Get in touch with Ian. He's on Facebook. He's finally on Instagram as of this week. He's finally on Instagram. I noticed. Yes, he is. <laughs> finally on Instagram. We can't get Coach Lenny on Instagram, but he's on Facebook. So reach out to us and we will make all this thing happen. I know Nicole, she has been behind the scenes kind of get this groundwork going. So I know it's going to happen, but we're doing this today to use this story as a catalyst to tell you that we have made it far as a nation with soccer, with nothing, absolutely nothing. Ian, what was your budget in 1995? Zero. Lenny, how much money did you get paid in 1995? Zero. And we got to the damn Gold Cup, people. Imagine if you at Harvard or Army or where, where, where are all your coaches? Um, everywhere. We have coaches every, of all races. Like a, a, we have coaches everywhere. Everywhere. Thousands. Everywhere. Imagine if you just showed up and just did what you know and love to do. The way this guy has, the way this guy has, the way I kind of do, and the way this lady wants you to do it. Only good and better things can happen. So, you know, when we're doing stuff, we're always talking about action items. That's the action item action item the thing that i'm asking for you in the listening audience who's been moved by what we've been saying and who feels the urge now to go do something get in touch with ian he's on facebook he's on instagram he's everywhere get in touch with nicole get in touch with me get in touch with coach lenny taylor and let's come down to st vincent and from there 
we spread it. When I, I'm, I'm a history student. I love history. The one thing I, might, I know about black American history, as bad as we've had it, and we have it kind of rough now, we're also recognizing and re-recognizing that. Folks all over the world in the diaspora, look at black folks in this country as the examples. They always have. They look to us because despite everything, we have achieved 10 times more than they have. So who else are you gonna look to? So again, I'm imploring you, you have the knowledge, you have the skill, you have the connections. We're offering you the opportunity and we have the time. So let's use it please. And with that, that's my spiel. I'm gonna let Coach Lenny say his piece and then Nicole, you can rack it up. And again, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to do this. It's called giving back. And, um, you know, you've got unfortunate brothers in the Caribbean, loads of talent. And of course, you're here in the first world. You get all the information, all the knowledge. It's good for you to just give a little bit back, man. You know, it'll be beneficial. You never know what you will be able to accomplish with kids. As a person who has gone through it, I have not, I'm not regretting it, not at all. There's so much happiness and so many lives that I've touched. And that's a good feeling. So I am supporting the recommendation. Ian Sardine has been at it for a while. Randy joined in into summer with his with his camps. And I see him on Facebook gathering all these soccer balls and boots. And I think he even have a um he has to keep them in, in a um a warehouse. Yeah, big that's, storage. That's what it looks to me. <laughs> so if you're out there and you have some equipment, again, he's on Facebook, pass it through. Just to summarize, I've never said this before, but at the end of the Cuba game in Cayman Islands, we were leaving the field and I heard some people calling me to come, come closer to the stand. When I got there, it was Captain Burrell, um, the former president of the Jamaica Football Federation, God bless his soul, rest in peace. Anthony James, another former Jamaica FF president and several presidents of different islands who came to the finals. And the question was, how the hell you guys did this? How? It's impossible how you guys did it. Now remember, Jamaica was knocked out by Cuba. They didn't go to the Gold Cup. And when you say football in the Caribbean, that's synonymous with Jamaica and Trinidad. And by extension, Cuba at that time. So this tells that all you need is some help from the diaspora in North America to go to the Caribbean and you can contribute and make a whole different opportunity for the children that are there. So, again, thanks to St. Vincent and the Grenadines Football Federation, the good people in St. Vincent who have embraced me and um, give me the opportunity to do what I do best. I don't know if I'll do it again, but <laughs> it's that <damn> tempting. <laughs> Ian, we'll, we'll let you uh, speak and then um, anything you want to say and then Nicole, you, you wrap it up if possible. <laughs> no, well, um, we have gone through a lot of what we wanted to get across. The, the kids are always in need of assistance and any assistance that we can get would be more than welcome. All right, that is it. That is right. it. again, Nicole. Thank you for the platform. Thank you for the opportunity. I hope folks in the Black Soccer Coaches Association or anybody else who's a lover of this game who sees potential in children, I think you can relate to this story. Go ahead and please listen to the podcast for the last time. It is tailor made. 
the 19, the improbable journey of the, of the 1995 St. Vincent and the Grenadines men's national team and their improbable run to the 1996 Gold Cup. It's in five parts. Anybody from Universal, Paramount, Disney, ESPN, <laughs> reach out to us. Reach out. It's a lot of money that can come from this. I can go help a lot of kids. So, Nicole, so again, you wrap this yeah. up. And again, thank you. Guys, thank you so much for the story. Um, it's your life. It's your life's work. And we appreciate all that you've done and that you continue to do. It truly is an honor to be able to share my platform with you guys. Um, I, I, I love you guys and all, everything that you guys have done. Really appreciate you guys. I thank you guys so much for being on episode six of Chair Talk. Um, sharing this with our entire coaching community. And we will be in St. Vincent to make a difference and to continue this work so that we see another Vincentian team in the Gold Cup. Shout out to the St. Vincent Federation, all of our friends there. Um, Ian, shout out to, to your, your company. Aranda, shout out to your camp. We'll see you guys soon in St. Vincent. Take care. All right. Thank you.